Take a look at this fast, powerful motion. This is my new robot actuator, and it's being controlled by a DIY ESC I built from scratch. It took four months of trial and error, but I finally brought it all together. In this video, I'll show you not only the design and assembly process, but also the results of my performance tests. The world of robot actuators is truly fascinating, so come along and experience it with me. This actuator I've developed is intended for the quadruped robot I'm building to sharpen my engineering skills. For dynamic movements like running and jumping, a high-powered yet durable actuator is indispensable. And you also need an ESC that can provide precise control. By creating a 3D printed actuator and designing my own ESC, I can integrate the actuator into the robot in a way that best fits my vision. That's the challenge I'm tackling in this project. So how can we create an actuator that delivers high torque, high speed, and superior durability? In this design, I built a high torque BLDC motor using a large diameter stator and powerful neodymium magnets, then installed a cycloidal reducer with a 10.1 ratio within the motor's internal space. This approach maximizes space efficiency and keeps the unit compact. Pairing a motor that inherently provides substantial torque with a relatively low gear ratio is known as quasi-direct drive. It strikes a good balance between torque and speed while allowing for back drivability, which helps absorb excessive loads, like sudden impacts, and reduces the risk of damage to the robot. Typically, robot actuators that house a reducer inside the stator use planetary gear systems. While planetary gears don't require specialized parts and are great for mass production, their structure tends to concentrate load on just a few teeth at a time, which can be a concern when using 3D printed resin components. That's why I chose a cycloidal reducer, which disperses the load across multiple rolling contact points and provides greater shock resistance, even with 3D printed resin parts. By combining a QDD approach with a cycloidal reducer, I'm aiming for a high torque, high speed, and durable 3D printed actuator. And here's the actuator I designed this time. In fact, this is version two, an improved design compared to what I showed in the previous video. So what exactly changed? First, with the previous actuator, rotating it caused the rotor and stator to make contact, producing an audible noise. The root problem was that the rotor and stator centers weren't properly aligned. I've identified three main reasons for that. The first cause is that the bearing intended to hold the rotational center was placed too far from the rotor and stator. This means there's no guarantee the center is correctly aligned where the stator actually sits. So for version two, I added a bearing inside the stator to maintain the rotational center at the most reliable position. The second cause is that the rotor itself was split into multiple parts to accommodate the cycloidal disc. The more contact surfaces you have, the more slight distortion and misalignment can build up. That's why, this time, I made the rotor completely from a single piece. The third cause is that the bearing clearance was too large. Normally, you'd keep the clearance a bit bigger if you assume the accuracy of a typical home 3D printer is limited. However, the JLD3DP service I used previously provides extremely high precision, which ironically increased the play and made center misalignment more likely. So for this design, I set both the shaft side and housing side to just a 0.05 millimeter gap and ordered the parts from JLC3DP, this video's sponsor. JLC3DP, the future of manufacturing with advanced 3D printing services. Their streamlined online platform allows for easy upload of 3D models, instant quotes, and real-time order tracking. From material selection to the speedy delivery of final products, they meticulously manage every step with production times as fast as 24 hours and delivery within just two days. By watching this video and becoming a new user of JLC3DP, you can receive coupons worth up to 60 USD. Check out what JLC3DP can do for you at the link in the description. The parts arrived about a week after I placed the order, and as always, the quality is fantastic. This time, the key point was testing the 0.05 mm clearance between the housing and the shaft to see if the bearing would fit perfectly. When I pressed the bearing into the housing, it locked into place securely. On the other hand, the bearing slipped onto the shaft without any need for pressing, so I think it could be a bit tighter. Next time, I'll adjust the clearance to around 0.04 mm. Even so, thanks to this new design and JLC3DP's high-precision 3D printing technology, the rotor spins smoothly without coming into contact with the stator. If you ever need high-quality 3D printed parts for your project, definitely give JLC3DP a try. Let's get started with the assembly. First, I'll attach the magnets to the rotor using adhesive. Neodymium magnets are extremely strong, so it was quite challenging to separate them. In this setup, I'm placing the magnets with alternating polarity. Once that's done, the rotor is complete. 
Next, I'll prepare the stator. I'll wrap 20 AWG magnet wire to form coils. For detailed instructions on winding, please check the link in the video description. Since I'm using a star connection, I'll remove the coating at the ends of the wires, solder them together, and then install the cover. Right now, I'm using 20 AWG wire, but to reduce heat, I might switch to thicker 18 AWG in the future. Once the stator and rotor are ready, I'll test the motor. Using an inexpensive ESC, it spins smoothly. That means the basic motor structure is complete. Now, I'll integrate the cycloidal reducer into the available space. First, I'll embed nuts so I can attach external parts to the actuator. Then, I'll cut the shaft to make a pin and assemble all the parts together. I'll install the bearings and spacers and apply grease to reduce friction. Next, I'll combine the eccentric shaft with the cycloidal disc. You can see how the disc's eccentric motion transfers the rotor's rotation to the output pin. Next, I'll place the second cycloidal disc out of phase with the first to cancel the eccentricity and reduce vibration. Finally, we put together the cover, output plate, and housing. All right, the robot actuator is finally complete. Let's hook it up to an inexpensive ESC and see how it runs. As you can see, it's running smoothly with no issues. However, while a low-cost ESC like this can handle basic speed control, it can't provide the precise angle control that's crucial for a robot actuator. To fully unlock a BLDC motor's potential, you need an ESC that supports more advanced control methods, like SVPWM. With that said, let's move on to the ESC development part. To begin with, an ESC is a device used to control the rotation of a BLDC motor. A BLDC motor has three signal lines, and by connecting each one to either VCC or ground, you can theoretically generate eight different stator magnetic field patterns. Among those patterns, 000 and 111 set all lines to either ground or VCC, creating no voltage difference so no current flows through the motor and the rotor doesn't turn. On the other hand, if you activate something like 001, only one line is connected to VCC, allowing current to flow and producing a stator magnetic field in the direction indicated by the arrow. The rotor, which has its own permanent magnet field, then aligns with that stator field and stops there. By switching among the six valid voltage patterns in sequence, the rotor can be made to rotate continuously. This is known as six-step control, the most basic method of BLDC motor control. However, six-step control has two critical drawbacks for robot actuators. First, there are very few possible stopping angles. As shown in this diagram, there are only six directions to choose from, which is nowhere near sufficient for precise joint control in robotics. Second, the torque changes abruptly whenever you switch voltage patterns, leading to a large torque ripple. This causes vibration and noise. That's where SVPWM comes in. SVPWM is a voltage pattern switching technique that creates an effectively intermediate stator field by rapidly toggling between multiple stator magnetic fields. For example, if you want a direction that splits the difference between 001 and 011 at a 1.2 ratio, you first output 001 for T seconds, then 011 for 2T seconds, and repeat that tens of thousands of times per second. From the rotor's perspective, it appears as though there's a continuous stator field angle in between those two patterns. Furthermore, by mixing in zero vectors like 000 or 111, you can control not only the direction but also the strength of the magnetic field, meaning you can essentially regulate both rotor angle and torque. As a result, SVPWM enables fine-grained angle and torque commands, and by transitioning those target values smoothly, you can greatly reduce torque or ripple. Now let's run the actuator at a low speed using both six-step control and SVPWM, and observe the differences in vibration and noise. First, here's six-step control. 
You can see there's significant rotor vibration accompanied by a loud low frequency noise. Next, this is SVPWM. The rotor spins much more smoothly and you'll notice a higher frequency sound instead. So far, we've learned that SVPWM is an excellent control method for BLDC motors in robotics, but how exactly do we implement these complex voltage switching patterns on a microcontroller? Surprisingly enough, all you need to do is output three center-aligned PWM signals simultaneously. Center-aligned PWM means arranging the on intervals symmetrically around the midpoint of a defined period. The ratio of that on interval is called the duty cycle, and you can freely set it in your program. Then you prepare three center-aligned PWMs with the same period and output them from different pins. For instance, imagine generating waveforms like the ones shown here. In one segment, it's 000, in the next 001, then 011, 111, back to 011, and then 001, and finally 000. The combination of signals on those three pins changes in exactly the sequence SVPWM needs. So if you repeatedly output these waveforms at 10,000 Hz, you'll achieve high-speed switching for SVPWM. Of course, a microcontroller's output by itself has very little power, so you use gate drivers and MOSFETs to amplify the signals enough to drive a BLDC motor. Finally, by adjusting the duty cycle for each of the three PWM signals, you can freely control both the direction and the intensity of the stator field. It's amazing to realize that such complex switching can be achieved with PWM, one of the most fundamental features of a microcontroller. Now let's move on to designing and building the ESC. I drew a lot of inspiration from Phil's Lab's ESC hardware design video, so if you're interested, be sure to check the link in the description. Here is the ESC circuit diagram I've put together. First, this section includes the circuitry that generates a clean 3.3V from the 16.8V supply, which powers the MCU and other components. Next, we have the MCU section. I chose the STM32G4 series, which offers high-performance timers and built-in hardware support for trigonometric calculations, ideal for BLDC control. Then there's the part that amplifies the three PWM signals from SVPWM to drive a BLDC motor. A gate driver boosts the microcontroller's 3.3V signals to around 16.8V, letting the MOSFET switches alternate between 16.8V and ground according to the PWM signals. In this area, you'll find a high-precision, low-resistance shunt resistor. By measuring the slight voltage drop across it, we can determine phase current, useful for advanced control methods like FOC. However, integrating too many new techniques at once can be overwhelming, so for now I've implemented smooth rotation via SVPWM and basic motion control using a magnetic encoder to detect rotor angle. As for communication, I went with I2C this time since I'm already familiar with it. I've heard CAN is better suited, so I'd like to try that in the next video. With the schematic complete, I proceeded to place everything on a six-layer PCB. I made sure to give VCC and ground-wide traces to mitigate heat, and positioned the MOSFETs and MCU on opposite sides to reduce noise interference on the MCU. Also, I placed all ICs except the magnetic encoder on the top layer to make reflow soldering more manageable. All right, now it's time to populate the PCB with components. We apply solder paste and place the components onto the PCB, then do a reflow soldering process. I used a heat gun to attach the magnetic encoder on the back side. The rotor itself has radially oriented magnets, and the encoder detects their magnetic field orientation. And now our ESC is complete. Now let's run a few tests to check the actuator's performance. First up is the angle control test. We're sending commands where the target angle shifts by 45 degrees each time. And as you can see, it's tracking them very accurately. Next, let's test the actuator's top speed. We're running at 16.8V and capping the current at 3.5A for safety. Then we gradually increase the rotation speed. It's spinning so fast right next to me, it's really scary.
Around this point, the rotor can no longer keep up, so we took that as the maximum speed and measured it from the video. It turned out to be 142 RPM. Moving on, let's measure the maximum torque. First, we attach a 1.25 kilos weight at a distance of 20 centimeters from the center. This requires about 2.45 nanometers of torque, and it clears that with no issues. Next, we tried 2 kilo and 2.5 kilos, and those were also lifted smoothly. Next up is 3.5 kilo. It failed to lift at this point. With the current capped at 3.5A, that seems to be our limit. To push higher currents, we'd need thicker windings to reduce heat buildup or use active cooling. Since these parts are 3D printed and have much lower thermal conductivity compared to metal, temperature is likely to become a major challenge. Actually, I'm already working on several new designs that feature thorough heat dissipation and offer even greater durability and power. I'm hoping to show you that updated robot actuator in the next video, so make sure to subscribe and stay tuned. Also, the data for the actuator and ESC feature today is fully open to the public. If you're interested, please check the description below for more details. Furthermore, if you're enjoying my project, I'd be grateful if you'd consider supporting me through YouTube memberships or Patreon. Your support truly accelerates my development. Thank you so much for watching all the way through. Don't forget to hit the like button, it really helps. And I'll see you in the next video.